his smart leadership helped turn around Chesapeake Bay. And thanks to decisions that he made along with my good friend Tim Kaine in Virginia, the blue crab population's up 60 percent over last year. And that's good news to folks who make their living on the bay, and it's good news who folks, to folks who like good eating. So Martin's been a great governor for a great state, which is why I hope you are fired up in these last few weeks. I hope you're ready to fight for Martin so he can keep fighting for you. Because there's an election coming up that's going to say a lot about the future. Your future, but also the future of this country. Now, I love you back, but I've got a good But, but I, want, I, I want to talk about this election now. I do love you, though. Two, two years ago, two years ago, you defied the conventional wisdom in Washington. You remember? They said, you can't overcome the cynicism of our politics. You can't overcome the power of the special interests. You can't make progress on the big challenges of our time. You can't elect an African-American with a funny name. They said, no, you can't. I'm sorry, what'd you say? You said, yes, we can. Here's, here's the trick, because I know everybody here remembers the inauguration, and uh, even though it was cold, everybody was having a great time, and Beyonce was singing, and Bono, and everybody thought, you know, this is great. But, but our victory in that campaign, that wasn't the end of the road, that, that was the beginning. The campaign by itself didn't deliver the change that we needed. It just gave us the chance to make change happen. And it made each of you shareholders in the mission of rebuilding our country and reclaiming our future. And I'm back today two years later because the success of that mission is at stake. We've got a lot at stake right now. On November 2nd, I'm going to need you just as fired up as you were in 2008. Just as fired up. Now, I, I want us to just go down memory lane here for the last 20 months so we understand where we've been, what we have to do, and where we're going. After that last election, it was my hope that we could pull people together, Democrats and Republicans because we had to confront the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. The worst, by far, in most of our lifetimes. Because although we're proud to be Democrats, we're prouder to be Americans. We wanted to bring everybody together. And I know there are plenty of Republicans who feel the same way in this country. But unfortunately, when we arrived in Washington, the Republicans in Congress, they had a different idea. They knew it would take more than a couple of years to climb out of this unbelievable recession that they had created. They knew that by the time the midterm rolled around, that people would still be out of work, that people would still be frustrated. And they figured that if we just sat on the sidelines and opposed every idea, every compromise that I offered, if they spent all their time attacking Democrats instead of attacking problems, that somehow they would prosper at the polls. So they spent the last 20 months 
saying no. Even the policies that they've supported in the past. No to middle class tax cuts. No to, no to help for small businesses. No to a bipartisan deficit reduction committee, com, uh, a commission that, that they had once sponsored. I said yes, they said no. I'm pretty sure if I said the sky was blue, they'd say no. If I said they're fish in the sea, they'd say no. See, th their calculation was if Obama fails, then we win. That was their calculation. Well, they, made a, they might have thought that playing political games would get them through an election, but I knew it wasn't going to get America through our crisis. So I made a different choice. Instead of playing politics, I took whatever steps were necessary to stop an economic freefall. I did what we needed to do, even if it wasn't popular, even if it wasn't easy, because y'all did not elect me to do what was easy. You didn't elect me to spend all day looking at the polls and figure out how to keep me in office. You elected me to do what was right. That's why you elected me, to do what's right. And 20 months later, 20 months later, we no longer face the possibility of a second depression. Our economy is growing again. Private, sec private sector jobs have grown eight months in a row. Thanks to Martin O'Malley's leadership, Maryland has gained over 33,000 jobs since January, the best start of a year since 2000 which, by the way, was the last time Democrats were in charge. There are three million Americans who wouldn't be working today if it weren't for the economic plan we put in place. But the truth is, we've still got a long way to go. We all know that. The hole we were in was so deep. There are still millions of Americans without work. There are still millions of families who can barely pay the bills or make a mortgage. Middle-class families who were struggling even before the crisis hit, and now they're just treading water. So of course people are frustrated. People are impatient with the pace of change. They want things to move a little quicker. I understand that. I'm impatient too. But the other side, they don't have an answer. All they've decided to do is to ride that frustration and that anger all the way to the ballot box. And right now, you've got pundits who are saying, well, the other party supporters are more excited. They're saying they're going to turn out at higher levels. They say that all of you who worked so hard in 2008, you might not be as pumped up, might not as be as energized. You might not care as much. That, that, that you might be willing to let the other folks who left the economy in a shambles go back to Washington and go back to Annapolis. Well, Marilyn, I, I, think, I think the pundits are wrong. But, but it's up to you to prove them wrong. Don't make me look bad now. I mean, I, 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 I'm betting on you, not on them. But it's up to you to defy the conventional wisdom. It's up to you to show the pundits that you care too much to let this country fall backwards. You want it to keep moving forward, that you're ready to fight for our future. So, so, so make no mistake, this election is a choice. And that choice could not be clear. I mean, th think about it. Th this is not as if candidates in the other party were offering new ideas. They, they didn't go meditate and say, boy, we really messed up. Let's try to figure out if we can do some things better. That's not what happened. It's not as if they've changed their agenda since the last time they ran Washington or the last time they ran Annapolis. In fact, the chairman of one of their campaign committees promised that if Republicans take control of Congress, they will follow the exact same agenda they pursued during the last administration. 
That's what they said. And we all know what that agenda was. Basically, you, you, been there, done that. <laughs> Basically, what, what they're saying is, we're going to cut taxes mostly for millionaires and billionaires. Then we're, then we're going to cut regulations for special interests. We're going to cut back on investments in education and, and clean energy and research and technology. And basically the idea is if we just put blind faith in the marketplace and if we let corporations play by their own rules and we leave everybody else to fend for themselves, then America is going to somehow grow and prosper. What does the young lady say? Been there, done that. I mean, th there's a problem with their approach, which is we tried it and it didn't work. It didn't work for middle class families who saw their incomes fall by 5% when they were in power. Middle class incomes fell. That's not, don't take my word for it. That's the Wall Street Journal. Meanwhile, your cost for everything from health care to college tuition went up when they were in charge. Job growth when they were in charge was slower than any time since World War II. Think about that. They weren't creating jobs. They're going around talking about jobs now. They had eight years. They took a record surplus left by President Bill Clinton. They came back with a record deficit by the time I took office. Now they're out there talking about deficit reduction. We saw what you had to do with the deficit. It didn't work when there was a free-for-all on Wall Street that led to a crisis that we're still struggling through today. Now, I, I bring this up not to relitigate the past. I just don't want to relive the past. I don't want to go through that mess again. That's the philosophy the other side wants to bring to Washington and wants to bring to Annapolis if they win in November. That's the philosophy that Martin's opponent espouses. Republicans might have given it a new name. They called it the Pledge to America. But it's the same old snake oil they've been peddling for years. Same old stuff. Huh. Same old stuff. <laughs> Now, now I, I, I want everybody to take a look at this Pledge to America. It's interesting, they, they put it out with great fanfare, but now nobody's really talking about it. But let's, let's examine their pledge. For starters, it turns out the pledge was actually written in part by a former lobbyist for AIG and ExxonMobil. I, you, you can't make this stuff up. All right, so they, may, so they helped write this thing. The centerpiece of the pledge, th their big idea, is a $700 billion tax cut for the wealthiest 2% of Americans. That, 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 that's, that's their big idea. So how, how many folks here make more than $250,000 a year? Just a show of hands here. All right. You need to, you need to donate to Mar Martin O'Malley's campaign. <laughs> for, the, for the rest of you, their idea isn't, isn't, isn't much. I mean, these are the folks who want to lecture us on fiscal responsibility. They want to borrow $700 billion. And then they want to give out tax cuts worth an average of $100,000 to millionaires and billionaires. And, and, and when you ask them, well, where are you going to get this $700 billion? They, they, don't, have, they don't have an answer. They, they don't have an answer. They don't know. I, I guess we'd have to borrow it from China. <laughs> but, but when you look at the pledge to America, it turns out they do have an idea about how to pay for a small portion of it. They want to cut education by 20%. That's a cut that would reduce financial aid 
for 8 million college students, including a whole